Hello, this is Greg Allison of Galactic Briggs coming to you with a video about sailing on sunlight, just like the sails of ships of old sailed on the wind. Now, sails are being developed to sail through space on sunlight. And this presentation will be by Les Johnson, NASA's principal investigator for interplanetary solar cell missions. And please, if you've not subscribed to my channel, Please subscribe, bang the update notification bell because you're already going to enjoy this video. Les is an excellent speaker, and uh, I've got many more videos to come. So please, like I said, subscribe, bang the update notification bell, and click the links below to support my channel. Hello, I'm Greg Allison, president of the Huntsville, Alabama L5 Society, the local chapter of the National Space Society, and I'm welcoming you here tonight to our program. Tonight's program is, is another program where we're looking far out into the future, but now it's upon us, and one more thing is coming up on us fast. Uh, this whole notion of I've, all my life since I was a teenager, I've been reading about light cells, the notion of uh, having uh, the sun push the solar cells out into space, and now it's beginning to happen. And I'm just fortunate to know that one of my good friends is one of the guys who's spearheading this. Uh, I've known uh, Les Johnson for Many decades now. Don't, you don't all... need to mention many decades. <laughs> <laughs> Les has always been a very, very bright, energetic, forward-looking guy who makes things happen. So he's always been in charge of these advanced propulsion ideas, but the cool thing about Les is he's one of the guys that makes these things real. He brings them about. And uh, he's been manager of, of several groups doing these advanced propulsion activities at Marshall for, for some time. And some of you are nodding your head because I know you've worked for him in the past. So I don't think we need a whole lot of introduction of Les Johnson. Ladies and gentlemen, Les Johnson. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And I just realized there's no mic. And I do t tend to talk loudly, but c can people in the back hear me okay? You good? If, if, if I fade out or you start not hearing me, just raise your hand and say, speak up, okay? And I'll, I'll try to do that. Of course, if I speak more loudly, the people in the front might want to run away. Um, <laughs> well, I didn't really, run <laughs> uh, Let me give you a quick background about me. I always think it's better to uh, have you a little bit know about the speaker because what I find is I have in common a lot with a lot of folks around here different things. I'm a physicist. Uh, I'm originally from a little town in East Kentucky called Ashland, Kentucky. Uh, it's coal mining territory, steel town. And ever since I was in elementary school, I knew I wanted to be a scientist and work for NASA. I didn't know what a scientist did. I knew that they had German accents because I watched <laughs> Disney and they had all Willie Lay and Von Braun on TV. And so I was ready to learn German, okay? And I was going to be a scientist. Um, I ended up uh, going to a small private liberal arts college in Kentucky, majored in physics, went on to graduate school at Vanderbilt, studied physics, ended up moving to Huntsville in 1988. I interviewed for a job at the Marshall Space Flight Center with a fellow who, who funded my thesis research at Vanderbilt, and he did not hire me, okay? <laughs> uh, so I ended up working for a contractor here in town until I got another opportunity to come at NASA and get to work with some of the folks that I, I see here in the room. Um, I will say that the person who did not hire me still works at Marshall, and every time I see him, I kid him about, you know, why didn't you hire me? Um, but anyway, we're having a, I really had a, a wonderful run at Marshall. I've been there 29 and a half years, and I don't plan to leave anytime soon, and you'll see why. I've got a pretty, couple of pretty exciting projects which are coming to fruition uh, where I feel like I'm making a difference, and I want to stick around and see these through flight and get the data analyzed and get to conclusion of that, and I'll tell you what that is. Uh, I also like to uh, call out my family, a uh, picture from the bottom right up here. They've been very supportive. Uh, a couple of years ago was a big year. My son and daughter graduated from college. They're both uh, continuing their graduate studies. Very proud of that. My wife, Carol, couldn't be here this evening, but she's been an incredibly supportive wife. Uh, I am a Christian. Uh, we worship at Westminster Presbyterian, and I'm also an author. Uh, I have to be careful, though. Tonight I'm representing NASA, not my author affiliation, so I try to avoid any questions about that during the talk. Maybe afterwards, if you want to talk about stuff like that, I can. Um, in my career, I've worked on uh, various front end of various projects, been involved in several flight projects. I've been what's called the principal investigator for a few of those. And if you don't know the parlance within NASA, the PI is kind of the, not the manager necessarily, but the person who has the idea, the visionary, uh, that takes the technology and assembles the team to go make these things happen, okay? 
Um, I've done that for various advanced propulsion technologies. Most recently, really in the last decade, I've been focused primarily on solar sail propulsion, which I'll be talking about tonight. Um, I don't know how many people are really intimately familiar with sales. Uh, the National Space Society, probably most people, but I can't assume everybody is. So let me give you a quick background about what a solar sail is and how it works so that we're all on the same page. And I do that by, by pointing out that uh, me and my colleagues tend to have this default assumption about space. And that default assumption is that it's big and empty, right? It's a vacuum, what's out there. And that's right, that's correct, as it is. But we tend to think of it as a big and empty, and we have to basically just get through it to get to the cool places. We have to get through it to get where we want to go. We have to survive whatever environment is out there, the radiation from the sun or whatever. But we don't really think about, wait a minute, there are immense energies in space. It's diffuse, it's low density, but there's a lot of it. Can we use it? All right. And when you think of space, not from an engineering point of view of how do we survive this and get through it, but from a physics point of view, well, what's out there? You look at space a lot differently. This is how uh, my colleagues in space physics view space. It's not big and empty. It's full of stuff, okay? It's full of sunlight. The solar wind coming out from the sun, which is hydrogen and helium atoms that are ionized and traveling at millions of miles per hour. You've got these immense magnetic fields around the Earth and coming out from the sun. And they're all interacting. And if you take all of this energy and you just capture it over a large area, it is immense. And it dwarfs the energy that's available in our rockets and everything else. But you have to figure out how to collect it over big areas and big volumes to make use of it. That's been our challenge. So if you look at space like this, you can think, wow, how can we make use of all this energy? Well, I didn't come up with some, a lot of these ideas. Other smart people have come up with them. But I've been in a place where I've been able to take advantage of other people's ideas, put it together with the engineering discipline that we have here in Huntsville, and get some projects going to show that this is possible. And tonight I'll tell you about how it works and why we're doing it. You can have something that's just possible, but there not be a good reason to do it, and therefore nobody gives you the money to develop it, right? So you have to have the idea, the capability, and the reason for doing it to make a project come together like solar sales have over the last few years. So, what is a solar sail? Well, really, it's analogous to this. Um, a, a sailing ship here on Earth, before we had uh, uh, the, the steam engines and now the electric uh, engines on our, on our boats to power us to go from place to place, we relied on the natural environment of Earth to get across the oceans. And the sailing ships did that very, very well. So they, they put up their sails, the wind comes along, and as the wind pushes on the sail, it's reflected from it, and, and the sail recoils and moves, and it drags the ship with it, right? So you're extracting diffuse energy from the wind, consolidating it into kinetic energy to make your, your, your ship move, right? Well, a solar sail works essentially the same way, but you don't use uh, air, wind, to make it work. What you do is you use the momentum of sunlight. So the lights in this room, and on a sunny day especially, you don't feel it because the push is very, very small. But when the light is reflecting from you, it, the particles of light called photons are bouncing off of you. And if you think of these light particles as like little BBs, they, they're, they're pushing on you. So if you, it'd be the same as uh, at Christmas when your nephew or your niece or your son or your daughter get a Nerf gun and they hang a sheet up and they shoot their Nerf gun at the sheet, it hits the sheet and the sheet recoils as the Nerf bounces off of it, that's your solar sail, and instead of the Nerf ball, it's, it's light, light pressure. So that's how a solar sail moves in space. There is a lot of confusion because Earth sails are propelled by the wind. A lot of people think that solar sails are propelled by the solar wind, and that's not the case. The solar wind are, is particles, protons, alpha particles, really don't affect a solar sail a whole lot. Solar sails are pushed by the sunlight that's out there. Now there are a class of sails called electric sails or magnetic sails that are propelled by the, the solar wind. That's a topic for a different discussion. We won't be going into that tonight. So how does a solar sail work? I mentioned that the light reflects from the sail. That's great, Les. How do you make adva take advantage of this to go anywhere? Well, it turns out that the light reflects in a predictable way, and as it does so, you can see where the thrust vector of the push is located. 
Those of you who, who may not be in engineering and science, you may have had physics, your first semester of physics in college, maybe even in high school, where you had this inclined plane and you had the friction of the block going down and the gravitational force. If anybody's remembering this painfully, nod your head, okay? So you remember having to calculate what the net force was and drag force and all that. Well, it kind of works the same way with a solar sail. And the light comes in, reflects from the sail, and the sail is propelled in some direction. Well, if you, uh, if you, take a, if you look at a real sail, it's not quite as easy as that because in this previous picture, you can see this nice flat sail perfectly flat like a solid mirror. If we were to fly a rigid mirror in space, it is so massive compared to the force of sunlight, it would hardly move. And you wouldn't have an efficient propulsion system. So what you need to do is you need to develop a very lightweight material that's highly reflective to use as your sail. So this material is on a plastic backing. This is the actual material from which solar sails that we're building them out of. It's a plastic that has an aluminum coating to make it reflective in the visible, which is where the sun puts out a lot of its energy, about 93% reflected. And you can see how nice and flat this is. That's because it's still on the backing. The sail we actually fly looks a little bit more like this, only not as wrinkled, because this has been handled by probably 2,000 people uh, by now. And it's been folded, and it's been stuck in my pocket and unfurled. And it's fairly robust, but you can tear it if you try. Please don't try. Um, I'm going to pass it around so you can get an idea of how heavy these solar materials, solar sail materials are. But when you fly a sail, what you do, and I'll, let me pass this around and I'll explain with the other one. This is the actual thickness. Uh, it's two and a half microns thick, about the width of your hair, those of you who aren't follically challenged like me. Um, and it's, it's very highly reflective and it's pretty robust. And there's an interesting story behind this material because this was not developed to be a solar sail material. Uh, this, this material was actually initially a paint that was uh, being tested for a thermally reflective coating for use on spacecraft. And at the end of some tests where they were testing all these different paints, the technicians came in to do the cleanup at the end of the test and they started scraping the paint off the wall and it peeled off in a single sheet. And they said, well, would you look at that? And the next thing you know, there's a patent, and there's a company that licenses the patent that's here in town. Uh, it's called Nexolve. They're the folks that built the, uh, the sunshade for the James Webb Space Telescope. They're building the, the sail material for our sail, and they license this technology from NASA. And it started out as a thermally reflective paint, okay? So that's one of those serendipitous moments in, in discovery. But when you're flying a sail, and, and you look at it, you like to think of a sail as being perfectly reflective and nice and flat, and so the light that reflects from it does it in a predictable way so that as you tip and tilt the sail, you know where that thrust vector is going to move relative to the sun, right? Well, a real sail isn't like that. A real sail is not quite as bad as that. It's mostly under tension, but it's bowed. It has to be stowed for launch. We can't launch a really big sail, say the size of this room or larger, without stowing it somehow in the rocket. So it has to be folded and rolled. And when you do that, you're introducing creases, you're introducing crinkles, and so you're getting non-uniform reflectance, okay? So you have a little bit of light going here, a little bit of light going there, and you have to take that into account in your thrust model. And if your sail isn't perfectly flat, say the boom doesn't deploy quite all the way, one quadrant or one part of your sail might not be as stiff as the other, and it bows a little bit. So you have to take into account all these different things is losses in your thrust efficiency to figure out how you're going to steer. Well, how do you steer anyway? Well, I'll tell you how you steer. If you weren't, intuitively, we kind of think that if, I'll, I'll put the sun in the back of the room here. Assume the sun is in the back of the room and I'm at the distance of the sun and the earth and I deploy a sail. Intuitively, you would think the sail is going to move just straight out radially away from the sun as the sunlight reflects from it. And that's correct if the Earth weren't moving. But we're moving. We're orbiting the sun once every 365 days, right? So anything we launch from the Earth is also orbiting the sun. So it's got motion this direction. As you deploy the sail and you change the angle that the light reflects from the sail, you can get your net thrust to already be in the direction you're already moving. So what happens when you give a little extra push in the direction you're already moving? You speed up. You're gaining energy. 
So you do move away from the sun, but you start spiraling out from the sun because you're in orbit around it and you're moving and the circle gets bigger and bigger as you gain energy. If you tilt the sail this way, you're losing a little bit of energy. You're, you're thrusting in the opposite direction from which you're moving. And as you lose energy, what happens? You spiral in toward the sun because the gravity starts pulling you in. Then something else comes into play. It's called the inverse square law. The inverse square law says that the amount of light falling on any piece of anything, a certain distance from the sun, goes up or down as the inverse square of the distance. Which means if I take this sail at Earth and I move it twice the distance of Earth out, another Earth distance from the sun, your first thought is, well, you get half the sunlight. Well, it doesn't work that way. If you do the math and you draw these spheres and you trace out how much light falls on the spheres, you find out you only get one-fourth the amount of light. So as you're moving away from the sun, your efficiency goes down pretty dramatically. It goes down as the inverse square of the distance, right? But wait a minute. Shouldn't it work the other way around as you go toward the sun? Well, it does. So as we're spiraling in toward the sun, our sail is getting more efficient, getting more acceleration. And if you get halfway to the sun from the Earth, you don't get twice the thrust. You get four times the thrust. If you go to one-fourth the Earth-sun distance down around Mercury, you get 16 times as the thrust that you get at the Earth's distance. So totally counterintuitively, a sail actually is better for sailing toward the sun than away from the sun. Because as you start falling in, you start falling in more and more efficiently. Okay? And you control your navigation by tipping and tilting your spacecraft and sail system, just like that. And that's illustrated here. You expand your orbit and spiral out, and you don't accelerate as much, or you accelerate more and more and more as you fall toward the sun. And the sail can be tipped or tilted by either using something uh, called a reaction wheel on the spacecraft, which is essentially a gyroscope spinning, and you can spin it up and spin it down, and that affects your spacecraft and tip and tilt. But when you get really big sails, you have to think differently. And how we think differently is you can change the reflectance uh, we, we're, we're actually putting on one of the projects that I'm working on, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, little uh, reflective control devices, which are basically, um, it's a coating that if you flow a small current through it, it goes from reflecting to absorbing light. And what you notice is if you absorb light, you only get half the thrust that you get from reflecting. So if I change the reflectivity of this quadrant to be less than this quadrant, then we're going to get a net push on one side of the sail versus the other side, and you can tip and tilt the sail that way. Uh, one of the other neat things about a sail is you're not confined to the orbital plane that you're in to go around the sun. You can tip this way and this way to speed up or slow down, but if you tip it this way, you can start raising your inclination out of the ecliptic plane that the Earth orbits the sun. And that's really important because that gives you capability very quickly that conventional rockets just can't do because it requires so much energy. And I'll explain a little bit more. Okay, how much push are we talking about? It isn't much, okay? It's on the order of a, the amount of force that you feel on your hand with a quarter and a penny is about the same, that's due to the Earth's gravity pulling on that, is about the same push as a solar sail that's the size of two football fields experiences. Okay? It isn't much. But when you're in space and you have no gravity to deal with and you don't have air pressure and you don't have that annoying person next to you, you know, bumping you or sneezing on you or something in flu season, right? You, you, you feel all that. But when you get out in space, the sunlight is constant. Constant acceleration. Constant. So you get, you go faster and faster and faster and faster. The example I like to give is if you take a spacecraft, a small one, and there's a reason I brought this, and I'll tell you what it is. And by the way, I'm not picking on a person who's coughing. He told me he was going to be coughing tonight. He's fine. He's not sick. Um, I apologize. I didn't mean to be rude in there. I just realized I, I used the wrong analogy under the circumstances. Um, if you take a spacecraft like this, and this is a spacecraft for a project that, that's going to fly. It's called Mia Scout. And we're packaging our sail in this volume here that's with the, the red and the yellow. So that'll be the propulsion system volume that will be our sail is stowed in. If you were to take a spacecraft with a sail like we're, we've built, and you were to take one that has a rocket that has this part packed with propellant and a rocket engine attached to it, 
and you put them side by side and they're in space and you say it's a race go well the one with the rocket is going to take off and it's going to go pretty fast and it's going to be out of sight and it'll run out of gas in about 90 seconds and it'll be moving pretty quickly and it's going to coast at whatever speed it got in 90 seconds forever because Newton's laws work really well in space, right? There's an action and reaction. There's nothing to slow it down. It's going to keep going. Your sailcraft, however, you're going to look at it and you're going to say, nothing happened. You'll come back the next day and it will have moved a little bit. And you'll say, well, that's not very impressive. The next day it will have moved like, quite a bit more and then more and more and more. And over time, depending on the efficiency of the rocket and the size of the sail, maybe in a couple of months, this is going to pass the one that had the chemical rocket because it constantly accelerates as long as the sun is shining. So that diffuse energy and this small push over time really counts for a lot in accelerating spacecraft and going from place to place. But it's a small push. And this is something I don't put math in my charts. In Huntsville, I probably would be safe doing that. But um, I'll, I'll tell you right now, there's one equation that governs everything for a sail system design. It's very simple. Force equals mass times acceleration. F equal ma. That's it. And the reason that governs everything is because a certain distance from the sun, the amount of force on your sail is fixed. The sun is only so bright, right? The larger your sail, the more of that force you can capture, but the more it weighs. So as your mass goes up, when force is constant, what happens to your acceleration? It drops. So the key to building a sailcraft is a large, very lightweight sail and a small spacecraft. People ask me, Les, is this the technology, is the sail that what has enabled you to build a solar sail now where we couldn't do it 40 years ago? No. This material is probably 25, 30 years old. What's enabled it is the miniaturization of spacecraft. Lightweight computers, <coughs> lightweight structures, is what has enabled us to build useful spacecraft that are small enough that we can now build realizable sails of the scale to make it work. And you'll, you'll see a little bit more in my talk. Now, solar sailing is not a new idea. Um, in fact, uh, we've known that, that light has momentum for over 100 years. It's a quantum thing, so even, in the, uh, even before we had quantum mechanics in the 1930s, uh, the momentum of sunlight had been uh, measured and you could calculate it in other ways, many ways, and it is a quantum mechanical effect. But in the early days of the space program, um, they were trying to understand the, the variation in density of the Earth's atmosphere, and this is probably hard for younger people in the room to understand, but at about the time I was born, in 1962, is when we finally started learning uh, how the atmospheric density varied as you go from the Earth's surface to, to the nothingness of space. We didn't know that until we started firing rockets through and taking measurements and launching these big balloons. This is a picture of an echo balloon, uh, launched, I think, in 1964. And this big silvery balloon uh, here, it packaged into a package that big. Doesn't take much air to inflate something in space, right? The pressure, is, it goes, the air goes a long way. Um, and they launched it in space, and then the aerodynamic drag brought the balloon into the atmosphere in a predictable way, and it lowered its, its altitude as it came in and burned up into the atmosphere. Well, as they were figuring out what the aerodynamic density was, they had to realize that there was also, on half a day, half an orbit, the sun was reflecting from this and pushing on it. And that solar pressure had to be accounted for in order to really get a true measure of the Earth's atmospheric density drop at those altitudes. So, you know, that was early on measured, calculated, and used. So this is really the first example of somebody uh, actually in a space application measuring solar pressure and its effect on an object in space. Fast forward, um, our friends in the former Soviet Union uh, were the first to really try to take and practically build a solar sail. They couldn't get funding. Uh, the, the Russia, the Soviets who were trying to do this, this is in the 1970s and 80s, had the idea of building a big sail and solar sailing. Solar sail ideas came around from uh, Russian innovators, uh, Silkovsky and Sander. Uh, who you've probably read about in your space history. Uh, they, they came up with the idea that you ought to be able to sail the sunlight winds and on all these other things. And so in that tradition, the Soviets came up with this idea of a solar sail. They took it to the folks in the communist uh, Politburo who governed science investments and were told the value of solar sails and why they should do it. And they were told, yet, we're not building a solar sail, sorry. 
So this same group of enterprising Soviets uh, came back and they said, you know, comrade, we have this problem in Siberia. And that problem is, it's a mess. Uh, alcoholism is rampant. Our industrial productivity is down. We can't compete with the Americans because of those long, dark, cold winters. And, and, and basically, there's no motivation for people to work. They're a bunch of alcoholics. We've got a problem. Uh, you think I'm kidding. This is the justification. And they said, what we need to do is we need to put big mirrors in space to reflect light down so we can light up Siberia at night and get rid of this seasonal affective disorder thing. Our alcoholism problem will go down. Our productivity come up, and we'll bury those Americans. Okay? So they got funded. <laughs> and they built Zanamia. Zanamia was launched uh, on, a, on a progress vehicle. It was an unmanned vehicle that rendezvoused with the Soviet space station at the time, the Mir space station. Uh, at the end of the, its mission, it brought up supplies. They loaded trash on it to deorbit de it and have it burn up in the atmosphere. But before it was going to burn up, they said, we want to do a test of one of these uh, lights, these mirrors. So they unfurled a large, lightweight, reflective material. It was a different material than we use today. And they got it deployed, and lo and behold, it worked. They were able to stabilize it, control it, and they even had photometers on the ground that were sensitive enough to measure the blip as it flew over. They could see it, right? So that was a success. So they went back and they said, comrades, this is working. This is great. Let's build a bigger one. So they got funding. We're going to save Siberia at night. So they built a bigger one. The second test was a complete failure. Uh, as the progress vehicle undocked from the Soviet space station, a, uh, an antenna didn't retract, and as they deployed the sail, it was shredded. Okay? So that ended their uh, mirror project, and the solar sail group basically didn't go away. The, uh, the story continues with them. Uh, they, they, they went into hiding, I guess, because you know two years later, the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, I'll let you draw the connection between the failure of the sail and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, so, Fast forward to uh, 2010. Um, in, in between these two times, by the way, uh, the Planetary Society wanted to fly a solar sail in that same time period. They hired, uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed, they hired the design team from the Zanamia to design their solar sail, and they built it. It was called Cosmos One. Anybody remember Cosmos One? Okay. Uh, yeah. Ah, there you go. Okay. Uh, Cosmos uh, was built. It was launched on a really good deal of a used, or not used, but a, you know, a surplus Soviet ICBM, and it went in the drink. The launch vehicle failed, and the uh, Cosmos One ended up on the bottom of the ocean swimming with the fishes. Okay? So the Planetary Society said, we, we, we better do something else. That's just not going to work. So here comes 2010. Uh, 2010 was a momentous year for solar sails. There were two sails launched. This is a picture of the world's first interplanetary solar sail. It was launched by the Japanese. It's called Icarus. Interplanetary kite craft accelerated by the radiation of the sun. And this is an actual uh, set of still pictures of the Icarus in flight, uh, taken uh, somewhere between the Earth and Venus. It was a spin-stabilized solar sail. They had a little spacecraft on board they kicked out. It was about the size of a coffee can. Had a camera, took pictures of the mothership, sent the pictures back to the mothership and home. They probably could get two world records, the first interplanetary solar sail, and it probably really was the first inter interplanetary selfie. It really probably was. Um, complete success. In that same year, NASA launched uh, Na NanoSail D. Uh, here we go, 2010. That was launched here, built here at NASA Marshall, again with our partners Nexol. It was a 10 square meter solar sail. And it was being tested on this new technology at the time of a CubeSat, okay? Now, a CubeSat, for those of you who don't know what that is, and I think most people probably do, but if you don't, this is an example of something to be CubeSat size. This is called a 6U. What that means is there are six blocks, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, and you put them together in different configurations to build your spacecraft. So in 2010, there was one that was half this size, so here, here, and here, and in the, in, in the, in the middle part of it was a 10 square meter solar sail. It was called NanoSail D2. And the first launch of that, uh, there were two, two units built, a, a flight unit and a flight spare, which was very fortunate, because the first one was launched on the third test flight of this new space company's rocket, SpaceX's Falcon 1. The first test flight crashed. The second space uh, flight crashed of the Falcon 1. And everybody thought the third was the charm, and we got this really low cost price to space, similar to what the Russians sold their 
Cosmos 1-4. And guess what? The third test flight of Falcon 1 crashed into the ocean. So our first flight unit of NanoSail uh, D got to say hello to Cosmos on the bottom of the ocean with launch vehicle failures, okay? But there was another opportunity, and it flew later in the year, the Flight Spear, aboard a project called FastSat, orbited in the Earth, deployed successfully, and a 10 square meter solar sail was flown in Earth orbit, done, uh, built here in Huntsville. Uh, since that time, the Japanese flew Icarus. Uh, the, light, the Planetary Society actually came in and looked at our design on NanoSail D and said, oh, that's great, we think we can improve on that, we're gonna get our private funding and go build, build this. So when you see the, the light sail, the first one that flew in 2015, looks an awful lot like NanoSail D. It was a 3U CubeSat, same kind of boom, same kind of material, packaged almost the same way. And there's a good reason for that. They sent their engineers to NASA Marshall and looked at what we did, which is what NASA's supposed to do, spin stuff off to industry and to private groups. So they had a successful flight of Light Sail 1. Bill Nye calls this the money shot. That was the only really good picture they got, and it is gorgeous, right? And that's what enabled them to get the follow-on funding to build Light Sail 2 and to complete Light Sail 2. And so Bill Nye called this the money shot. That's what turned on the flow of money. And, and uh, one of the things that's real frustrating living in an engineering culture, uh, for me, as a person who's a little bit not as cautious as a lot of my engineering colleagues are, and again, some of you know me a little bit know that, um, I believe you need to have a money shot on your space mission. And when people talk about, well, we don't have a requirement for a camera, I think that's just foolish. Sorry. <laughs> I, I have to forget I'm on the record here speaking for NASA, but it is foolish. I think we need cameras on everything, right? Um, so, because you get, you get the public to go along with you when you do that, even if there's not a good science or engineering reason for it. The Canadians have flown a small sail. I was a part of this team that was at the University of Surrey in the UK uh, for the inflate sail, which used inflated booms. And it was, again, as a 3U CubeSat experiment. Uh, now you're getting into modern times. There are two solar sails in orbit right now. Did you know that? Two, okay. There is the light sail two, from the Planetary Society, which was launched earlier this year, completely successfully, they're up here flying around. Uh, there's a small business, coupled with the University of Illinois uh, in Urbana-Champaign, that launched CubeSail. Uh, it's, it's not a square sail like we're talking about normally. It's a, it's a long, thin strip of aluminized material, but it's got the same surface area. Uh, they have a planned deployment, actually, this month. The, the, cube, the spacecraft's been in orbit, they haven't deployed their sail yet. That's supposed to happen this month. Uh, before the end of the year. And then the two, I've, in what time I have left, not taking a lot of time, I better speed up, um, our, our near-Earth asteroid scout and solar cruiser, and I'm really pumped. Um, near-Earth asteroid scout is a project that began in 2014. It is a 6U CubeSat. This is the size of the spacecraft. We're going to have a sail made of the material that I passed around that will deploy from the middle part of this that will be 86 square meters. That's bigger than the floor area of this room, okay? And it's all going to come from the middle of this spacecraft. Um, in this spacecraft, in addition to the sail material, you have to have booms. Every good sailing ship has to have a mast, right? We have four booms. They're 23 feet long, four of them. Uh, they look like they're metallic. They're a little heavy, but they've been flown in space, so that's why we picked it. Uh, your, your PI, who sold the project, <coughs> said we want one miracle on this flight, and that miracle is the sail. Don't try to sell me some new material that's never flown before. Don't bring in some boom that we've never tested in space before. I want everything that's been tested because the miracle is the solar sail, that we can navigate and do what we want to do. So we have an 86 square meter solar sail deployed, uh, uh, covered by these booms. Uh, our goal is not to test a solar sail. Our goal is to fly a camera, which is being provided by NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and a spacecraft, which is built at JPL, uh, we're just building the sail propulsion system here at Marshall. And we are going to take a two and a half year cruise uh, to fly by an asteroid and learn about it, take some science data, take high resolution photographs and beam them back to the Earth with our telemetry, our spacecraft telemetry. So we are a demonstration of a capability to do low cost reconnaissance of near Earth asteroids. <coughs> um, if you look at the recurring cost of our spacecraft, and we've priced it out, if you wanted to buy a, a Unit 2, after all the engineering design work is done, the spacecraft, flight-proven components, is about $10 million. Now, for you and me, that'd be a big hit to your retirement fund, exactly depleted multiple times, right? Um, but for a space mission, that's pretty darn cheap, 
okay? And uh, that's the whole purpose, is this supposed to be a low-cost reconnaissance capability to understand uh, the neighborhood, the near-Earth asteroids that are, that are near the Earth. So, NIA Scout, this illustrates the scale. There's the <coughs> spacecraft, that's me. Uh, there's the deployed sail relative to a school bus. Gives you a little bit of a, a sense of scale for the NIA Scout. This is our target asteroid, 1991 VG. This was discovered in 1991. VG is a characteristics of the asteroid. Uh, the reason it doesn't have a fancy name is that the person who discovered it had already named an asteroid. And the International Union of Applied Aerospace Scientists, whatever the group is that lets you name asteroids, uh, has this thing that says if you're an amateur astronomer and you discover one, you get to name it along certain rules, right? Uh, but after the first one, they, re they reserve the rights for naming asteroids. So, uh, but but in, about two years ago, as we're looking into this, I discovered that in their rules, there's a second class group of people who get to name asteroids. And that is if you're the principal investigator of a space mission that flies there, you get to name the asteroid. Okay? Uh, fortunately, this is not an Earth crosser. There is no risk that it's ever going to hit the Earth. So if I decide to name it after my wife, I'm safe. Uh, uh, this is a picture a little bit about what we look like and how we're going to fly by. Uh, we will fly within a half a kilometer of the asteroid. Uh, the asteroid's moving about 21 kilometers a second. Uh, the solar sail will accelerate us fast enough to match velocities and fly by at about 10 meters per second. Now people ask me, Les, why don't you go into orbit? Well, a 12 meter asteroid doesn't have much gravity. And you can't turn off the thrust on a solar sail. Okay? So as long as the sun is shining, even if we're mostly sideways to the sun, we're not perfectly smooth, so we're going to have a little bit of our surface reflecting light and getting thrust. So you can never really stop with a sail. You have to get rid of it if you're going to do that. So what we do is we're going to fly by the asteroid and do our science. Now, those of you who are rocket scientists are going to get jealous at this point because if we don't get enough science, we can take about two months and we can turn around and fly back the other way, okay? And at the end of mission, if the spacecraft is still functioning and there's something else interesting nearby, and we can convince the people who control the purse strings for the mission operations center where we, get, we check in with the spacecraft once a week, we'll just go somewhere else, okay? So that's the beauty of a solar sail. You can just keep going until something breaks, okay? That's not the way we do normal space exploration today. And the, the other nice thing about this is if you worry about launch windows, we can launch just about any time. We're a secondary payload on the SLS. Uh, so when the big rocket flies, there'll be 13 small spacecraft kicked off. We're one of those. But we don't really care when it actually launches in the launch window because it's just a matter of how long it takes us to get to our target asteroid, whether it's a year and a half or two and a half years, because we don't have to worry about a launch window. We, just, we can just keep accelerating and get there. Okay. So that, that's another nice flexibility you get with a sailcraft. Um, I'm going to skip to the next uh, project because this is, okay, this will knock your socks off. I was, it knocked mine off when we won. I didn't think we'd win. Um, about a year and a half ago, the, the, at NASA headquarters, there's a division of science that wants to study the sun. Heliophysics, sun physics. And this division has had in its vision missions, things that they really want to understand, is understanding more about the sun. And you would think, well, why don't we already know everything there is to know about the sun? It's up every day. We've got spacecraft looking at it. Well, think about how big the sun is. 105 Earths across the equator. That means 105 Earths from the north to the south pole. And the Earth orbits around the sun's equator, give or take a few degrees. Do you know that we've never really looked at what goes on at the north and south pole of the sun? How could we understand the Earth's weather if we didn't have anything looking at the poles of the Earth? We, we couldn't, right? And so there's been one mission by serendipity that had about 90 days viewability to look at the North Pole of the Sun. And that's it in the history of the space program. That's it. Done. Okay? Because it takes so much energy to get out of the ecliptic plane where we orbit, to go into an orbit where you're orbiting the north-south of the Sun. No rocket can do that. I get a question. What about electric propulsion? That's great. You'll get up about 15 degrees, and then you'll run out of gas. Okay? Electric propulsion is 10 times more efficient than chemical but it still requires fuel and you run out before you can do that. A solar sail of the appropriate size with a small spacecraft, again appropriately sized, can get to the North Pole in about seven years. We can launch, crank it up, and study what we've never seen before, which is the North South Pole of the Sun. So this division at headquarters, just, just that right, 
I'll, I'll take questions at the end if that's okay. So this division headquarters said, we need new technology. So we're going to issue a solicitation for new technologies that will help us study the sun. And there are lots of good ideas. They have other needs besides looking at the North and South Pole. So I convinced a team that we wanted to propose a sail demonstration to show that it was possible to build a sail big enough that you could fly this mission. We're not doing this mission. We're demonstrating the capability of a sail. The one we're flying on Nia Scout just isn't big enough and doesn't have the performance to do that. You need a much larger sail. So we put together a team, again with our partners here in Huntsville, Nexol, building the sail, small business in Colorado called Rocor. We partnered with Ball Aerospace, who builds a lot of spacecraft, good at building small spacecraft. And we wrote a proposal for a really big solar sail. And we called it Kantiki, in honor of the Thor Heyerdahl Explorer. And if you're of a certain age, you remember there was an Academy Award-winning movie called The Voyage of the Contiki about how, that proved that South American indigenous peoples could have built the ships that settled the Polynesian Islands. Okay, really cool stuff. So we had the Contiki proposal. We submitted it. We waited, we waited. Uh, we got a bunch of questions from NASA headquarters that led us to believe that they didn't think we could do the job because they were really hard questions in the interim. I mean, they, they do the, all the projects. And there were 17 proposals of different things. We were the only solar sail proposal. Other people proposed instruments and different things to do science. So last August, I got a notification that the next day I was going to get a call to let me know whether my team won or lost. And you know, why do they do that? I couldn't sleep. I'd rather they just call me and not warn me that we're going to call you tomorrow. Okay? It's like, why did you do this? So, in the day of a cell phone, they don't need to tell you to sit by your phone. You know, just, it's here. But, so anyway, the next day comes and they're going to call in a window between 10 and noon. 10 o'clock, nothing. 10.30, nothing. nothing. 11 o'clock, oh, this is bad. Okay, this is really bad. About 11.15, I got the call we won. And the reason I didn't go to call earlier is because people who win tend to get on the internet and say, hey, we won. And they didn't want the people who didn't win to find out they didn't win for the people who won. So they saved the winning team for last. Okay, which makes sense, right? But it was torture. <laughs> it was torture. So we won. So we're building Solar Cruiser. Solar Cruiser is... An 18,000 square foot solar sail. Okay? About 40% the area of a football field. We are launching on a launch that's already scheduled as a secondary payload. We're not the primary payload. The primary payload is a mission called IMAP, Interstellar, Interstellar Mapping Anisotropy Pre Probe. It's, it's a big flagship mission. But they're launching a rocket that is, is really big, it has a big payload ferrying, it has extra volume and extra mass capability. So they put what's called an ESPA, it's a, it's a secondary payload adapter, and they're going to take along four other spacecraft that each weigh about 200 pounds. One of those is going to be Solar Cruiser, okay? Uh, we have to get through a confirmation review next year. There's still a chance we won't fly. If I, in other words, if my team hoses it up this year, we're not going to do it. So we, we have a lot of pressure to get through this confirmation review next year, and if we do, we, we're going to fly. I, I've got a positive attitude, you know, we're going to do it, so we're going to catch this spot and we're going to go. But we're going to fly uh, toward the sun to a region called L1, Sun-Earth-Lagrange point. Now, this point's not really a point. It's a region of space, and it's a lot more complicated than this, but the easiest way to think of it is the sun's in the back of the room. It's enormous. It's got lots of gravity. holds this little teeny tiny in Earth orbiting it, right? And there's a, Earth has gravity, too, because we are on the surface, right? We fall. So, you know, logic would tell you that there's some distance you can go between the Earth and the sun where Earth's little gravity will exactly counter the big mass of gravity of the sun. Well, it turns out there is. It's called L1. And that's a lot closer to the Earth. It's 1 93rd approximately the distance from the Earth to the sun. Well, it's actually less than that. Um, but it's, it's out there, and, and the distance is about right there. So if you put a spacecraft there, it can't stay there forever on the Earth's sun line. You have to thrust a little bit. And we have spacecraft out there doing that, but it doesn't take much energy to do it. But if you go closer to the sun than that, you're in a different orbit, so you're going to want to drift around the sun. We're not. We're going to deploy our sail. And we're going to stay on the Earth's sun line for months, showing that the sail can do constant thrust to do stationary. <coughs> and then we're going to tilt the sail, and we're going to show we can raise our spacecraft out of the ecliptic, because that's what the people who want to build the solar polar imagery want to do. That's our tech demo. Uh, if we're successful, not only does NASA want to fly the solar polar imager, but NOAA, the weather people, also provide space weather and when we have solar storms. And they do that because they have a spacecraft at this Earth-Sun-Lagrange region 
that detects the radiation from the storm before it reaches the Earth. They send a radio signal which travels faster than the storm, and we get tens of minutes, a few tens of minutes warning that there's a solar storm coming, which is a big deal. That's a whole other talk we can give, but, but it's a big deal. They want to double the warning time. Turns out, we can double their warning time. We can take a sail close enough to the sun, a little bit closer in, and so NOAA is interested in what we're doing because they want to take a copy of what we fly, and they want to put their space weather sensors on it and have it be a part of the NOAA operational systems by 2030, which is pretty cool. All right? So we've got a lot of interest in what we're doing with that. Uh, this has taken a long time. John, how long have I been working solar signals? Long time. Right? <laughs> Almost. But don't say forever. 20 years. 20 years I've been working on solar sails. And there's a lot of effort that has gone into it. And this is a chart somebody at headquarters, NASA headquarters, said, hey, can you tell me what technologies and what projects over the last few years have fed into Solar Cruiser? Well, this is it. There's been a lot. A lot. And um, so we have the, the NanoSail-D, which led to the um, Planetary Society work up here. It led to the NIA Scout. Our experience on near-Earth asteroid scout has led to this. Uh, Nexol, who builds the sunshade for James Webb and the materials, that's led into this. The businesses we're working with have led to that. So we've we had quite a few things feed into the into the project. This is a kind of a, a drawing of what it's going to look like. Uh, we are going to have booms, but instead of metal booms, remember the NIA scout has metal booms. What's the equation you have to remember for solar sails? All right, we want to get that mass down. So we're not using metallic booms. Ma ma metal's heavy. We're using graphite composite booms, okay, which are really, really lightweight, uh, 30 meters long, three feet and a meter roughly, okay, okay, 30, 100 feet plus booms, okay. Our sail material is the exact same material you see here. We also had a project at Marshall, which, which I've been involved with, called LISA, Lightweight Integrated Solar Array. And so what we're doing is we're embedding thin film photovoltaics in the sail to help generate power while we fly, to cut down on the mass of solar panels you have to carry which are heavy. So we're generating power with the sail. Um, we have those reflective devices I mentioned where you flow a little current through them and it darkens part of the sail. We're going to control our momentum by basically uh, doing that, lightening and darkening the sail. We also have a, a, a little bit of masses that are moving, but I want to get away from that in the future. I don't like moving stuff in space. that They tend to seize up and freeze up. So we like, I like electro-optics better than mechanical systems. Um, we're carrying an instrument to look at the sun. It's called a coronagraph. How many saw the total eclipse? Not just here in Huntsville, the little bit of the eclipse, but the salt total. You remember the corona? The thing that, you know, you see the streamers coming out, and, and you know, your jaw drops, and you start salivating, and your spouse is wondering what's wrong with you, you know, and, oh, really, look at that. I mean, it's just amazing, right? It, it, it just knocks your socks off. We're gonna, we have an instrument. This is done all the time, but they want to occult the sun and study the corona. And, and by doing this with an instrument on the ground and where we're going to be viewing from, they get a stereo image of the corona. And you can do all kinds of science with that. And this particular instrument is a new technology for building a coronagraph. So that's part of our payload. It's also a technology to be demonstrated. And it's going to be provided by the High Altitude Observatory in Boulder. Um, I won't bore you with the details, but we're a one-year mission. This is our timeline. We're going to launch. We're going to deploy the sail. We're going to check out. We're going to learn how to fly it. We're going to test the instrument. We're going to raise out of the ecliptic. And at the end of mission, we don't have any consumables, so what do we do next? Extend your mission. It's extend mission. <laughs> so we're, we're planning to carry that science instrument, which we're testing, and actually start doing science. It's called a science enhancement option. So if we're still working at the end of the year, we're going to do some science. Uh, that's what this is about. So I have mentioned solar storm warning. Uh, there are other cool things you can do with sails. Uh, I've been talking to um, uh, some folks at the Air Force who want to know what everybody's doing in low Earth orbit and in, in space out to geosynchronous orbit. So what better place to do that than from above the Earth's pole looking down on everything? Well, it turns out if you can balance gravity with a sail at the Sun-Earth point, you can also balance the Earth's pull by putting a sail and having it hover over the North Pole or the South Pole and orbit the Earth at the same time you're doing, where the sail is not orbiting the Earth, it's literally hovering on sunlight pressure to exactly counter the Earth's gravitational pull. Uh, we'll demonstrate a capability, not a big enough sail to do that, but that it's possible. We aren't going there, but the sail could if we designed it to do that. And just to illustrate the point of what I mean, you know, if you're in space and you throw a penny off the space station, it's on orbit around the Earth like you are. If you took a penny 
and dropped it from our sail hovering over the North Pole, it would fall to the Earth. It would not be in orbit. Okay? So we're talking about a hover. We're not doing that on Solar Cruiser, but that's one of the things future sails could, could do. Um, but here's the real reason. I'm a science fiction geek. Um, I want to build solar sails because I think it's a step toward building really big sails that could take us to the stars. Uh, in, in the literature, in the 1970s, a brilliant man named Robert Forward, who I had the privilege of working with and knowing, uh, wrote a series of scientific papers that did the first math showing how big a solar sail would have to be to get a really close deployment to the sun so that you could fly it to another star and have a trip time of under a thousand years, which is not short, but chemical rockets take about 70,000 years to get to the nearest star. So he did that calculation and it came out to be a pretty big sail. Think the size of Texas, okay? As thin as this. In other words, we can't build anything like that. But physics says it's possible. It's not a warp drive. It's just, no offense to my engineers, it's just engineer, right? And material science, okay? I'm a physicist, right? It's physically possible, it's just engineer. Okay, so that's the challenge. So 20 years ago, John, John Cole here, I think you were a part of this, we put together, as a good bureaucrat, I work for NASA, I'm a bureaucrat, right? I put together a roadmap that says, how do we get to the Texas size sail? Well, first you fly something about 10 square meters. <gasps> Nano CLT. We did that in 2010. Then you go a factor of 10 larger. Wait a minute. 86 square meters is about 100. That's about Mia's gap. Okay. And then you go another factor of 10. That's about 1,000 square meters. Solar Cruiser is actually 1,600 square meters, which is 18,000 square foot. So this roadmap, bureaucratic nonsense that we put together 20 years ago, we're on step three. Okay, we're on step three. Now I want to mention, you make a transition out here, you can go to solar or laser power. You may have heard about the Breakthrough Star Shot, I don't have time to go into that, but light is light. And you can use sunlight or you can focus light to, on your sail to go really fast. So a lot of people want to use really high power lasers to accelerate sails even faster and get that trip time down from a thousand years to maybe under a hundred years. And that should be doable, okay? The problem is we didn't have the materials. When this roadmap was drawn, this was made out of unobtaining, okay? Well, in 20, 2004, a discovery was made in Manchester, England of a material called graphene. Graphene is single atomic layer thick carbon. Uh, the team that discovered it didn't invent it. It was there all the time. It's another story. It was in pencil lead. Nobody knew it, but it was there. They isolated it, they measured the properties of it. People can make it now in small coupons. It has the material strength we need to build a solar sail the size of Texas. That when I started working on solar sails, it was unobtainium. That sail material exists now, and it didn't exist 20 years ago. Now we don't know how to make it big, as big as Texas, but the engineers and material scientists have found the material. Now, anybody here work for the Army? or has worked for the Army in here, okay? Got a few people. The Directed Energy Weapons Directorate here in Huntsville is building high-power lasers, solid-state lasers. They have multi-tens of kilowatt lasers that are solid-state that will fit on the back of a truck, electrically powered. When I started my career in the job that I got when I didn't get into NASA, I was working on missile defense, and we were looking at lasers. And at that time, those lasers didn't exist. And to get that kind of power, you had to have these big hydrogen fluoride rockets and it was a nasty mess to build big, powerful lasers. Today, they have lasers like that on the back of a truck, okay? 100 kilowatt class lasers that didn't exist at that time. Now, to build this is gonna take megawatt class lasers. But you know, the technology's advancing. I don't think it's that far away. I really don't. I don't think I'll see it in my lifetime. Maybe not the generation of, this, of the new engineers and scientists that are hiring at NASA now, but I bet the next generation will be flying laser-powered sails potentially on voyages to other stars. Because we are on our way. The, the, the steps are being made and the capability is there. And so I'm, I'm gonna end, it's a long talk, I'm sorry, um, by just telling you what, motivated, what motivates me. People ask me, I had to take one of these management <coughs> gaze at your naval classes uh, that you, you, you do every now and then. I'm sorry, I don't mean to offend anybody. Um, <laughs> And, and in that, there was an exercise, they said, you know, you need to come up with, uh, 
you know, your, your, your statement of purpose for why you do your job. You know, try to really understand what makes you tick. Why are you here? What do you do? Why are you doing this? And we got around and people had, oh, I want to be interested in exploration. I want to do science. That's great. I respect that. You know, and people said, well, I want to enable teams to do this and that. That's all wonderful stuff. And they got to me and I had to be honest. And, and my honest answer was, I want to be a footnote. And what do you mean? Well, when the first outpost on a planet orbiting another star is established, and they're looking at the history of how we got there, I want my work to be a footnote in that book. That's what motivates me to go to work, is I want to be a footnote. So with that note, footnote, I'll conclude and take any questions you all might have. So. Let me start. Roddy had his hand up. I'm going to work my way back front, and I'll get you in a minute, sir. Go ahead. So you mentioned it might take seven years to spiral up to the pole of the sun. Yes. When Ulysses was launched, it had to swing around Jupiter to get, his, like you said, a single flyby. How long did that take? That took about seven years. Yeah, yeah and they got a single flyby. They, they got over and gone. Okay. We're going to be in orbit. So, And we'll be studying uh, high altitude that we really don't know much about what goes on above about 55 degrees because the angle is just bad. And so the, the new science will start long before seven years. It'll be about three or three and a half years into the mission. We'll start getting really good new science uh, when that actually flies. And again, solar cruisers not doing that. We're just showing that it's cap we're capable of doing that. Now we had a question in the back row here. Did you, yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's, okay, the, the sail that you passed around. What is the uh, weight per square uh, square area of that sail? Um, wow. Of that, but see, when, when I talk about the area, it's called aerial density, which is a figure of merit for sails. How much mass per unit area? So I like to take into account not just the sail material, but the booms that deployed it. It's around 25 grams per square meter. Okay, and that includes the boom. Uh, the solar cruiser is going to be around less than 10 grams per square meter. And if you don't think grams in your daily life, which I don't outside of work, it's all grams and kilograms and all this stuff at work, and I come home and like, you know, give me a measuring cup and you know, ounces and whatever, uh, three raisins are about a gram. Okay, that's approximate. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember 25 years ago, Star Trek Deep Space Nine had this one episode where they used solar cells. And I remember thinking about it since 1994, when I saw that episode. And my question specifically in that context is, how, and what, is there a lot of, like, say, sci-fi, and, and say, media, various novels, short stories, movies, et cetera, that involve solar cells? There are, there are quite a few. Uh, I, I saw a solar sail in one of the uh, Star Wars prequel movies, you know, the ones we don't like to talk about. Those three, you know, it was Camp Lord Doku's sail or whatever it is. It was this beautiful, he was evil. So it was this big black sail. And, and my first thought was, I can design one twice as efficient. <laughs> Here's this high tech, they got warp drive, and they're, I mean, you know, trans warp drive, and they're all excited about this black sail. So, so yeah, it's out there, but you got to look for good stuff. Uh, we were talking earlier, there, there's a great short story by Arthur C. Clarke called Sun Jam. It appeared in the magazine Boy's Life in 1964. A lot of the people that I have learned from on solar sailing that were preceded me in working on sail technology were all inspired by an Arthur C. Clarke short story that they read when they were in elementary school, okay, called, called Sun Jam. Uh, the Mode in God's Eye is the book that got me. That was by Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell in the 1970s. The Mote, M-O-T-E, in God's Eye. And it was basically uh, on Earth, we were looking out, and there was these strange reflections and such coming from a star and what it was is the spillage from high power lasers that were beaming uh, solar sail, light sail propelled starships toward the Earth, and it was an alien invasion propelled by light sails. <laughs> and it, it, it was, oh, this is great stuff, you know? So it, it was. It's really well written. It's a good story. It's scientifically fairly accurate, re really good stuff. Um, Robert Forward had written some short stories that, that feature sales because he really worked on sales. So there's a lot out there. And you can go on Wikipedia, probably in Google, I mean, and look up, you know, science fiction stories that feature light sales and you'll find quite a few. Yeah. Yeah, over here. Yeah. Uh, related to that, how big would a solar sail using this technology have to be to carry a man's Oh, boy, that'd be big. Um, we're heavy, no offense to anybody. 
Um, we're, we're heavy. We, we weigh a lot. And the supply equipment to keep us alive weighs a lot. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick my neck out a little bit and say that we won't be transporting people with these things for a long time. Because to get the efficiency, you'd have to build like really, really big sales. Okay? And weren't the Zivin uh, Modis, uh, weren't they in hibernation as well? Yeah, because it was still a multi century <laughs> voyage. It wasn't faster than light, so it was still, you know, a long time. Um, that's the, that's the, the sa I, I hate to disappoint people, but we don't have warp drive. And, and nature pretty much says we can't do it, okay? And so we're limited to sublight speeds. But if you're limited to sublight speeds, this is a really good way to go, right? Now, I am, an, I am a physicist, and I'll be the first person to tell you physicists have been wrong when they've said something is impossible, right? Because right now, this is a, folks, whole other topic, whole other topic. We are in physics today with dark matter and dark energy, where physics was at the turn of the 18th, 1800s to the 1900s, where they didn't understand all these weird things that led to quantum mechanics, okay? I believe we have an equivalent moment in physics today there's a lot about the universe that we just don't understand. And when we finally understand it, I think we may open some doors to things that we previously thought were impossible. Now, is one of those faster than a light drive? I don't know. I'm just not going to tell you it's impossible. Because I think we're on the, on the edge of a revolution in physics. Personal opinion. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of questions I'd love to ask. Uh, and maybe this is a little too large, but I'll, I'll ask it. So, I'm not afraid of large. You saw that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, so we, you know, it's been, having read The Wind from the Sun, which was, <coughs> sure. you know, I look forward to solar cell technology and been very frustrated, I'm sure. You have been doing it professionally. The, the, question, uh, the question is, uh, what have we learned so far from the small amounts of emissions that we've actually launched? And, and probably more importantly, what things do we need to know? Sure. Okay, I'll tell you, as, a, as somebody who's spent a long time working on these and working with the community of people who built sales, the infatuation, and I'm choosing that word deliberately, with sales has been, how big can we build it, right? Well, as we were building the Near Earth Asteroid Scout sail, where we aren't just deploying it to see what happens, which is what every sail mission, even the Icarus really was that way, just deploy it and see what happens and take measurements. We actually have to go somewhere which means we have to accurately control the tip and the tilt, which means we have to characterize how much loss we have from wrinkled sail, bowed sail, lost sail, all that kind of stuff. And we discovered how hard it is over time to control momentum. Here's the, the sail. Sunlight pushes on this pretty much uniformly. Unless your spacecraft is exactly at the center of mass, you get a torque and you have to control that torque. And there's some weird things happening when you control the XY torque and you add them together, you get a net roll torque. And this, I'm not a mechanics guy, so you mechanical engineers, you can come in and school me if you need to, but you get this roll torque, all right? That's really hard to manage. We will lose control over our sail unless we're constantly adjusting our tip and our tilt and our darkening of the corners to account for all these differential torques on the sail. So I'm going to tell you what we learned building the Scout, which is a bigger problem on this big sale, is managing the momentum. <coughs> Fifteen years ago, if I'd given this talk, it would have been all about how big the sale's going to be, and which is exciting. But the hard part is navigating and controlling this big sale. Okay? And if, for those of you that, that are mechanical engineers, the, the natural frequency of these things, sales are big, and they take a long time when there's a disturbance in them for that to damp out. And it makes a real challenge for stability of your platform. That's, that's a big challenge. So it's hard. It's hard. Over here, yeah. I guess I have two questions. One is, what is your basic flight support equipment that you're going to take with you to sure. control this? And how big is it and heavy? And how do you communicate back to Earth? And the second part is, uh, you have space debris, you have meteor showers. <coughs> so how do you going to? Well, the first part's easy to answer. We use just the same kind of lightweight spacecraft components that fly already. We use for, for controlling our spacecraft attitude and the tip and tilt of the sail. We have the reaction wheels, which are gyroscopes that spin up or spin down in conservation of angular momentum. It's why you stay upright on a bicycle when you start rolling the wheel, right? Um, the tip and tilt with the lightning and the darkening. We also have what's called a mass translation table, which we have to have on Neoscout, but 
My designer's not here. I hate it. Okay? I hate it. I really do. I just despise it. And the reason for that is to keep the center of mass and center of pressure together, we, we have to actually manipulate the sail slightly x, y relative to the spacecraft constantly. So that's a moving part. And there's lubricants and gears and motors and yada, yada, yada. And that's just stuff that breaks over time. Right? So on Nia Scout, we have to do that. We have to manage our momentum by moving up, down, and sideways. On Solar Cruiser, we're trying to get away from that. So we have this lightening and darkening of the sail with this new electro-optic coating because you don't have any moving parts. You just apply a little current, it goes dark, you can control it. But for risk mitigation, because that's never been done before, and I have more miracles on this flight than I normally do, we're also putting our XY table, because we're demonstrating that on Nia Scout, so we're taking a bigger one to have a backup. Okay? you got to have fun with what you do or you don't do it, right? Uh, and your other question was micrometeoroids and debris. We will be hit not by debris because we're out of Earth orbit and there's not much debris in interplanetary space, but there are micrometeoroids. And, and they're traveling so fast and they're t most of them are so small, we will get hit. But if you look how thin this is, an object that hit a, 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 a grain of sand moving at 18 kilometers a second that hits this is going to be through it in no time at all. The amount of energy it loses and deposits in our sail is very, very small. And so it pokes a hole. Now, if I took a chunk of aluminum and the same little big grain of sand hits this, it'll make a big pot mark and it'll be like a bomb going off because all that kinetic energy gets turned into heat as it gets stopped in the aluminum and the rapid expansion of heat is an explosion which makes a boom, a debris hit, or not debris, but micrometeorite, hit, which could end the mission. But the probability of that's really small because our spacecraft is small. Our sail is really big, so we're going to get hit. But we've done tests, we've done modeling, it's just going to put little holes in. And our flight model, we can sustain 3 to 5% area loss over the mission and still keep control of the sail. Hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how, what's the lifetime limit on some of these uh, vehicles and these systems? And what's the life limiting item? The life limiting item on the near-Earth asteroid scout is the flight computer. Um, over two and a half to three years, the cumulative radiation dose is probably going to cause the computers to fail, the chip, this the system to fail. Uh, we've got a little bit more mass on this vehicle, on the solar cruiser, so we can control that. Uh, the life limiter there is going to be money uh, for, the, for the extended missions and how long we can keep it out there. But I would say seven to ten years easily uh, with that system we could keep flying if, if we were able to keep the control center going to do that. Uh, but by that point you're going to start having failure of your electronics and, and things like that because the total dose is what really kills you. And if my darn, and, and, and the other thing that's a risk, although it doesn't seem to be as big of a risk because it's pretty well understood, is that darn translation table. Because if it seizes up, we lose control of the sail. So that, that's a risk, uh, particularly for Yeah. Uh, if you haven't asked a question, then we'll go. Yeah, go ahead. I want to ask a little more about the material that you passed around. What, what um, so there's aluminum there? There is. A about 100 angstrom aluminum deposited. It's a plastic, it's a polyimid, uh, and it's a proprietary formulation for Nexol here in town. Similar to uh, it, it, It's a cousin. And the nice thing about it is we put it in the space environmental uh, test chambers to do life tests. And Mylar and Kapton all basically turn to ash in the UV and radiation environment. This material, uh, it degraded somewhat in its structural integrity, but it didn't fall apart. And light pressure is not much, right? And there are very few forces acting on it out there, so it'll be fine. It'll is be there fine. another coating on top of the aluminum? I'm sorry? Is there another coating on top of the aluminum? No, no, just aluminum. Uh, we, we probably will put, uh, there's no oxidation because there's no atmosphere out there, so it, it stays in pretty good shape. Uh, we may on future sales put a chromium layer on the back, especially if we're flying close to the sun because you get hot. And even at 93% reflectance, you're still absorbing 7% of the sunlight. And you might start running hot. So chromium, black chromium in particular, has a high emissivity and get rid of a lot of heat. Because your back of your sail is always facing deep space, which is cold. So we can control thermally a lot that way. Yes? As you're scaling up in size, at what point do you have to manufacture the thing in space? Mm. Is it unfurling it from something, a little thing that you have here? I think we're almost at that limit. Uh, we may have to launch them in pieces and put them together in quadrants. Uh, there are companies now made in space, actually uh, has a 3D printer that works in space from raw materials that extrudes booms. Uh, so I think in the future you might use space manufactured booms. 
Um, so I think you're going to be close to that not too far from now. Um, I think the solar polar mission the scientists want to do will be able to launch from the Earth. But an order of magnitude or so beyond that, which is in my plan, so um, you're going to probably have to start thinking to about it. Yeah, you might have to actually start making the stuff out there. I, I, we're not close to that point yet. But, but I think there'll be a point of diminishing returns that you'll eventually have to do that. Anybody else have a question that hasn't asked one yet? Yeah, go ahead. Well, what kind of looking at the payload for the solar, uh, solar polar vision, the funnel wrap? And the okay, the total spacecraft mass, uh, we're estimating about 200 kilograms for the total spacecraft, uh, about 140 kilograms non sale mass, which will give you 25 kilograms of science payload. Okay? Um, and with miniaturization of instruments, that's not bad. It's not bad. Um, and you've got all the power you need. Uh, we'll fly at a half an AU, so it'll be twice, half the distance to the sun uh, from the Earth to get good efficiency for cranking in our orbit. So that's, yeah, about that, a few tens of kilograms. Yes? Uh, I think you've answered most of my questions. I, I came in as a sailor expecting to see something about lift. A sail with lift, oh, but it's all the impulse of photons on this surface. That's all it is. That's okay. correct. Yeah. There's no Bernoulli principle no, or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. You're exactly <laughs> correct. Yep. Doesn't sail that way. It's all reflective light. Okay. Yeah. You know, somebody could probably get creative and do something like that, but that's that's not what we're that's not yeah. what we're about. Yeah. So you're talking about flying closer to the sun and more energy. Uh, how close would the thermal techniques that you have? Can you actually get to the sun? This material and system we think can be good down to about uh, 0.45 AU. Okay, uh, the Earth's sun distance is one astronomical unit, so a little half and a little closer. Uh, but then you start running into thermal issues with plastic, right? So we have to start thinking about something else. But remember, we've got graphene in the wings. Um, we're not quite ready for building big sails out of it yet, but but we will be. Um, so, yeah, so I think we'll be able to get there. It's going to be a challenge. Now, for these, these interstellar missions, you know that Texas size sail? Mm -hmm. That was, in theory, going to be deployed at like 10 solar radii. That's like way inside the orbit of Mercury. So it it's truly was unobtainable. But if you look at the thermal and mechanical properties of graphene, it's no longer unobtainable. So that's what excites me. <coughs> is, is this stuff's really, really coming. So how do you get the current to control the surfaces of the... Um, Good question. Um, you want that to be located as far from the center as you can to get the most torque. All right. And this is a current debate in our team, interestingly enough. Um, the conservative team members, which I tend to side with because my miracle is my 18,000 square foot sail, right? They want to run a cable all the way from the central hub all the way out here to power those. But that adds mass. And what's the equation? F -E I don't like that mass, okay, because it hurts my performance. So I don't want to run a 30-foot wire to power these things. But we are all, but we're also testing the embedded photovoltaic. And so we're also going to have a segment where we have the, the light and darkening, the LCD that's out here, and we're going to have an embedded photovoltaic next to it, connected to it to generate the power, and then all we have to do is tell it when to turn off and on, and we don't have to run a power cable out. So that'll be tested on Solar Cruiser to be implemented on the polar imaging mission, but we may get a little bit conservative and reduce risk by running power from the hub with cables to make sure it works. So that's a good question. And that's an ongoing debate right now, and in fact, my team is supposed to brief me on Monday for me to make the decision as to which way we're going to go. So it's a very timely, a very timely question. Yeah. Okay. Well, with that, I really better break. It's been a long time. Thank you all so much. Once again, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please, if you've not subscribed to my channel, subscribe. Bang the update notification bell to get notifications of more videos to come. And click the links below to support my channel. Thank you for watching.